Hello horse racing fans and welcome back to another video. This one has been decently anticipated by you guys. I had quite a few ideas for what my next video was going to be, so I decided to let you guys decide in a community vote. And you guys picked this one, the top 10 underrated racehorses video. Now if you remember about two weeks ago, I covered what I thought were the 5 most overrated racehorses, and this video is going to be a spiritual sequel. And just like that video, it's going to be incredibly subjective and 100% my opinion. So if you want to make your own underrated racehorses video, I implore you to. Because underrated racehorses are so vast, there are so many horses throughout history that don't get the representation or discussion that they deserve. So just limiting it to 10 horses was really difficult, and you'll notice that with how many honorable mentions are included in this video. But for now, I did my best and I compiled a list of what I thought were the 10 most underappreciated racehorses in my personal opinion. So without further ado, let's dive into it. Kodashan. Now there definitely are a few Horse of the Year recipients that have been forgotten to time. In fact, there were some that were on older versions of this list, but eventually got pushed down to honorable mentions. But one of the few that stuck, by the skin of his teeth at the tip of the list, is the 1993 Horse of the Year recipient, Kodashan. Mainly thanks to the fact that he was far from the most popular horse in 1993. He wasn't even the most popular turf horse of 1993. That would be the Hall of Famer Lure, who won his second consecutive Breeders' Cup mile. Despite that, it wasn't enough for Lure to win Champion Grass Horse, let alone Horse of the Year. Instead, Kodoshan took both honors in a racing campaign that saw him win five Grade 1 races in California from distances of a mile and an eighth all the way to a mile and three quarters. And even after winning the Breeders' Cup turf, just three weeks later, he shipped halfway across the world to run in the Japan Cup. It was too much for him, but he was still game to be second, despite such insurmountable odds. He was definitely properly recognized during the time he raced, but as the years went on, not many people brought up his name afterward. And that is very unfortunate, and a very general thing for turf horses in the 90s. There are many great 90s turf horses to bring up and mention that just don't get the attention that they deserve, while the dirt horses of that year were highly praised. And I'll admit I'm pretty guilty of this myself. I've never been as knowledgeable on turf horses as I have dirt horses throughout horse racing history, and the 90s is definitely no exception. But while developing the list, I got a bit of insight from another source, Jack Sargent from The Racing Rundown, who in general is a lot more knowledgeable about race horses from the 1980s and 1990s, not just turf horses, but in general, and also will be presenting number 9 on this list. So now it's time to talk about Sky Beauty, in my opinion, the best horse of the Breeders' Cup era to have never won a Breeders' Cup race. She was trained by the late Hall of Famer H. Allen Jerkins, probably the best horse that Allen Jerkins ever trained. And Sky Beauty was extremely versatile. She could do just about anything. She could win stakes races. She won stakes races from as short as six furlongs back when she was a two-year-old all the way up to a mile and a quarter. And regularly, she was running in races, uh, altering from seven furlongs all the way up to that aforementioned mile and a quarter distance. She's the most recent horse to have won the Philly Triple Crown, which at that time was the Acorn, the Mother Goose Stakes, and the Coaching Club Oaks, as well as, in addition to those three, she also won the Alabama. Now, the reason that she makes this list is because of her runs in Breeders' Cup races, which should... Let, let's just get the elephant out of the room here. Those left a lot to be desired. She was off the board in two Breeders' Cup races. She only missed the board in two starts, and those were both her two Breeders' Cup races. One was at Santa Anita in the 1993 Breeders' Cup Distaff when she was a three-year-old filly. The other one was at Churchill Downs in the 1994 Breeders' Cup Distaff. In that uh, 1994 Distaff, she was coming into that race after an undefeated season. She, w she wasn't favored in the race, interestingly enough. A fun fact about her two Breeders' Cup races, she was not favored in either of them. And her 1993 distaff is one of the most weirdly bet Breeders' Cup races of, uh, of really, of Breeders' Cup history, but that's beside the point. She was last in that 1994 Breeders' Cup distaff. She didn't perform as poorly in 1993, but she still finished off the board, left a lot to be desired. In 1994, she was... She had won the Vagrancy, and then from the Vagrancy, she went up all the way into the distance of a mile and an eighth uh, in 1994. Just 
overall one of the, the greatest horses that, or one of the greatest race mares, I should say, not greatest horses. Uh, she's one of the greatest race mares of the 20th century. Uh, I have had conversations among people that I've talked to that there are not many horses that I would take over Sky Beauty if we were to have a hypothetical matchup of all the greatest female race horses of all time. There are very few horses that I would put above Sky Beauty in that kind of a race or just in that in any kind of a ranking. And uh, it's truly unfortunate that she did not perform on the Breeders' Cup stage because uh, Sky Beauty was as good as you could have possibly been without ever having won a Breeders' Cup race. And, you know, obviously for someone like Alan Jerkins, he missed out on uh, an accomplishment like a Breeders' Cup with her, and she was the best chance that he was going to have at that. So that's all that I have for, for Sky Beauty. Uh, just a, a truly unfortunate s scenario of a horse that was so good uh, for so long in so many races, but her two shots on the biggest stage, uh, she did not show up. And that's why we find her on this list. The good thing about her, though, is, you know, she did win the Eclipse Award as champion older horse in 1994 and is also a member of the Hall of Fame. So she does have some accolades, but you do not for as good of a horse as she is or as she was, I should say, you do not hear nearly enough about her. Cole Town the horse given the displeasure of being the stable mate of Citation. And that sums up how most people remember Coltown. Even when people tried to shine light on his career many years after he had raced, he was always still dubbed as the overshadowed stable mate to Citation. His entire life and the way that he is remembered is as the forgotten champion, the most underrated racehorse of the 20th century, according to the New York Times making him one of the most obvious choices for a top 10 underrated racehorses list, which paradoxically makes him less underrated by comparison. But we can talk about how he's remembered later. Let's talk about his racing career and why he gained this reputation in the first place. Going into the Kentucky Derby, Coltown was actually the favorite ahead of Citation, because Citation had lost one of his prep races to a long shot named Saggy. Meanwhile, Coltown set a track record in the Bluegrass Stakes going into it. And at the beginning, it looked like Coltown was going to live up to his favorite status, opening up six lengths at the start of the race. But eventually, he was caught. And after that, everyone just talked about Citation. And rightfully so, he won 19 of 20 races that year. But Coltown still deserves some love. And in some ways, he did get his shot in the spotlight in 1949, when Citation was injured and Calumet needed another Horse of the Year candidate to run in his place. So, he was an understudy, pretty much. Not exactly what he would have hoped for, but still, he didn't disappoint, winning 12 of 15 races that year and setting or equaling three different world records from a distance of a mile all the way to a mile and a quarter. Those performances helped him win champion handicap horse, however, under Horse of the Year, it was more divisive. He won under the Turf and Digest, however, under the daily racing form, Capo, the champion three-year-old of that year, was chosen instead. Still, he is one of the two horses recognized as Horse of the Year of 1949, so he definitely fulfilled his purpose. But as a 5- and 6-year-old, he just wasn't the same racehorse. But if you only look at his 3- and 4-year-old seasons, he won 20 of 31 races, set multiple track and world records that are too numerous to mention, and won 3 end-of-year awards. Even during the 1948 season against Citation, he still won Champion Sprinter. A great racehorse simply given the bad luck of running the same year as one of the greatest of all time. And so he makes it in at number 8. Paradise Creek, or as Tom Durkin likes to call him, Porn Ice Creek. Who surges past Paradise Creek? Jokes aside, Paradise Creek certainly deserves a spot on this list for many of the same reasons as Kodashan, except he got less accolades. If Paradise Creek had ran in 1993 just like Kodashan did, he probably would have been awarded Horse of the Year. But unfortunately, he peaked in 1994, so he had the displeasure of running the same year as Holy Bull. So just forget having those Horse of the Year dreams entirely. Despite this, I think Paradise Creek had a more impressive season than Kodashan, and is even more overlooked. Because just like with Kodashan, whenever people think of early 90s turf horses, they usually think of Lure, who was Paradise Creek's rival. And Lure did beat Paradise Creek quite a bit, however, most of those defeats were during the 1993 season. When Paradise Creek peaked, he kind of flipped it into his favor, beating him 2-1. And let's talk about those wins, shall we? Because there are quite a few things that he did that we're not going to see again from a turf horse. He won the last running of the Washington DC International, which used to be one of the biggest turf races in the world, and it was the same year that he won the Arlington Million, two races that no horse had won the same year before or since, but that's more down to just the fact that one of those races doesn't even exist anymore. His bigger achievement, though, was the unofficial turf triple crown that he did. Right before the Kentucky Derby, the Breakness, and the Belmont, there's always a big turf race that's run right before it. The Turf Classic, the Dixie Handicap, and the Manhattan Handicap. 
Like a true Triple Crown champion, he won the Turf Classic over his old rival Lure, beating him for the first time ever, then just two weeks later, he trounced him again in the Dixie Handicap. Even after winning two big turf races in just a matter of two weeks, he still had something left three weeks later in the Manhattan Handicap, setting a new course record for a mile and a quarter, 157.79 seconds, and he did it under a hand ride. And to sweeten the deal, this is still a course record at Belmont Park to this very day. And he made it look like he was doing it in his sleep. By the end of the year, he had won 8 of 11 races and had never finished worse than 3rd. His one weakness, and probably the main reason why he's not very well remembered today, is because of the Breeders' Cup. Paradise Creek was a middle-distance turf horse, and that simply just didn't work in the Breeders' Cup's climate. All his greatest achievements were between a mile and an eighth and a mile and a quarter, which isn't a bad thing if you're a dirt router. However, if you're a turf router, you're kind of set up for failure, because your only options are the Breeders' Cup mile, which is too short, or the Breeders' Cup turf, which is at a mile and a half. And it definitely showed with two of his three defeats in 1994 being at a mile and a half. First, he was third in the Breeders' Cup turf, and then just two weeks later, he did exactly what Kodoshan did, shipping halfway across the world to run in the Japan Cup, and gamely finishing second. Although that one was even more excruciating than Kodoshan's defeat, because he lost by a nose bob. All in all, Paradise Creek is probably one of the greatest middle-distance turf routers ever, a niche that was unfortunately unideal for the greatest stage in American racing. And so, he isn't as recognized as he deserves, and makes it as number seven. Exceller. You ever heard of Old Friends? It's an equine retirement facility for former racehorses to live out the rest of their lives in comfort. I've been there myself, and it was absolutely spectacular. I got to see many great horses that I will never forget. But one of the unfortunate reasons why Old Friends exists is because of the tragic mistreatment of previous champions such as Ferdinand, and number 6 on our list, Exceller. Despite being such an amazing racehorse, Exceller's end was absolutely unjust, with him being sent to a slaughterhouse. While it does eventually have a happy ending with places like Old Friends coming to make sure that things like this don't happen again, the fact that this even happened at all to such a great racehorse still makes my blood boil to this very day. And I feel like Exceller deserves to be remembered as more than this. He wasn't just a martyr for horse racing, he was also a great champion on the racetrack, so let's shine some light on his unique career. At the start of his career, he raced in Europe, winning Group 1 races in France, such as the French St. Ledger, and in England, where he won the Coronation Cup. And then he acquired his first Grade 1 in North America, in the Canadian International. But in 1978, that was when he peaked. He ran in multiple Grade 1s on both turf and dirt, and was winning them, taking the Hollywood Invitational Handicap on the turf, and then there's a start later, winning the Hollywood Gold Cup on the dirt. But his biggest victory of all was in the 1978 Jockey Club Gold Cup, where he truly took his place in history. In that very race was the 1977 and 1978 Triple Crown winners, Seattle Slough and Affirmed. Affirmed got taken out pretty quickly thanks to his saddle slipping, but Seattle Slough ran absolutely crazy fractions up front, causing a pace meltdown and giving Exceller a chance to sneak up. Seattle Slough proved to be the winner in defeat, fighting back with every bit of heart that he still had even after such rigorous early fractions only to lose by a nose. But the winner of that very race was Exceller as he became only the second horse in history to beat two different Triple Crown winners in his lifetime. You'll actually hear the other one later in this list. He was the epitome of versatility, winning great in Group 1 races in four different countries on two different surfaces. And yet, he never won a single Eclipse Award, and his only lasting accolade was getting into the Hall of Fame in 1999. Truly one of the greatest horses never to win any end-of-year awards. And now Exiller lives on, making sure that current race horses have a better chance of a future off the track. There's lots to love about Exceller. Wajima. Foolish Pleasure was a great three-year-old horse, winner of the Kentucky Derby and second in the other two jewels of the Triple Crown. And then after the Triple Crown, he faced off against older horses such as the Great Forgo. By the end of it, he was champion three-year-old horse. Or you would think, after doing all of that, but he wasn't. 1975's champion three-year-old horse was actually Wajima. And you might be wondering, how could a horse like Wajima outdo a future Hall of Famer like Foolish Pleasure? The simple answer was, he beat him. After winning the Mammoth Invitational by a neck and then winning the Traverse Stakes by over 10 lengths, Wajima faced off against Foolish Pleasure, Forgo, and Ancient Title in the Governor Stakes and the Marlboro Cup Invitational. These races were only 12 days apart. And in both of them, Wajima was facing off against three future Hall of Famers. And although the winning margins were close, in both of those races, Wajima came out on top. But as quickly as he rose to the top, winning four Grade 1 races in the span of just over a month, 
he was gone. He only ran two more times, Forgo getting his revenge in the Woodward Stakes, and then Grouplan getting his revenge in the Jockey Club Gold Cup. After that, Wajima retired and was given champion three-year-old horse. Wajima was a classic example of short and sweet. While he didn't have the longevity of such great horses as Forgo, when he was at his peak, nobody could stop him. Not even three Hall of Fame inductees racing against him twice in a span of two weeks. In 1940, Charles Howard owned a little horse named Seabiscuit, who would go on to win that year's Santa Anita Handicap in his final race. Exactly a decade later, in 1950, Charles Howard owned another Santa Anita Handicap winner. And that's number four on our list, Noor. They even wore blinkers similar to Seabiscuit and had an interesting origin story. Although not exactly as much of an underdog as Seabiscuit was, Noor didn't always start out so great. He raced in England during his two and three year old seasons and was modestly successful. And then when he shipped to America, he had a slow start, not really doing much of note in 1949. However, when 1950 rolled around and Noor turned five years old, he really came into his own. Five times he would contest against the great Triple Crown winner Citation. The first time, both of them would lose, with Citation finishing second and Noor finishing third behind Ponder in the San Antonio Handicap. However, every time after that, Noor finished ahead of Citation. The first time, Citation was carrying 22 more pounds. By their fourth and final meeting in the Golden Gate Handicap, Noor was carrying one pound more than Citation. And then he proceeded to set a world record at a mile and a quarter, 1 minute 58 and a fifth. After this race, however, he did hit a small rough patch, finishing second behind one hitter and Hill Prince in multiple different races. Hill Prince would go on to be Horse of the Year, but Noor would get his revenge in the Hollywood Gold Cup, where he would swing on by and defeat an all-star cast that included the eventual Horse of the Year, as well as the 1949 Kentucky Derby winner Ponder, and the 1946 Triple Crown winner, Assault. Before Exceller defeated Seattle Slough and affirmed in the Jockey Club Gold Cup, Noor would defeat Triple Crown winner Citation and Assault. He beat Assault twice and Citation four times. There may never be another Sea Biscuit, but Noor sure does come close. Gunbo. During the first half of the 60s, there was no greater racehorse than Kelso. And more impressively, there was no horse as great as Kelso for so long. Even the greatest racehorses of all time never could match Kelso's longevity. Five years in a row, Kelso did two things, win the Jockey Club Gold Cup and win Horse of the Year. Since Kelso, only one horse has even come close to equaling that mark, and that was Forgo with three Horses of the Years. However, there was one thing that Forgo did that Kelso couldn't, and that was win four Woodward Stakes. And Kelso almost did win a fourth Woodward Stakes, but one horse's nose was just an inch ahead of his, and that was Gunbow's. In 1964, Gunbow faced off against the mighty Kelso five separate times, and managed to defeat him twice. By the time they faced off against each other for the first time, Kelso was a ripe seven years old, and still just as good as ever. Meanwhile, Gunbow was a late developing four-year-old, taking handicaps in both the East and West, such as the San Antonio Handicap and the Gulfstream Park Handicap. But when they finally met, neither won, with Mongo taking the Mammoth Handicap instead, Kelso second, Gunbow third. But then, they would really exchange blows. Next time they faced, Gunbow would obliterate Kelso by 12 lengths in the Brooklyn Handicap, and then in his next start, he would get revenge on Mongo by obliterating him by 10 lengths in the Whitney Handicap. One more win later, Gunbow faced off against Kelso for the third time in the Aqueduct Handicap. This time, Kelso would win by three parts of a length, and then just a start later came their most famous duel, the Woodward Stakes. For a solid quarter of a mile, the great Kelso fought against Gunbow every step of the way, with both of them being separated by just inches, and at the line, Gunbow came out the victor. It was truly the highlight of his career, and then it would be followed by his greatest defeat in the DC International. He was able to beat the very best turf horses in the entire world, except for Kelso, who left him in his wake setting a record for a mile and a half on the turf. That race concluded their rivalry, with Kelso winning 3-2 and securing his fifth and final horse of the year. But during that time, not many horses could claim to have challenged Kelso so deeply as Gunbow did. And unfortunately for Gunbow, due to the time that he ran, he never secured any Eclipse awards. Although eventually he would get his just desserts by being inducted into the Hall of Fame. Gunbow is definitely one of the best horses to have never won an Eclipse award. And it's not even his fault. He just had the bad luck of running against a Titan. And even against that Titan, he held his own, looked him in the eye, and fought him to the very finish and won.
So now we'll move on to Spendabuck, the winner of the 1985 Kentucky Derby. I'll start with his early career uh, and campaign. And this is a horse who always showed some early flashes when he was a two-year-old. Now I say that and not really knowing exactly what his races uh, down when he was running at Calder and River Downs looked like. I say that uh, given that I have had people tell me that they were very impressive. I should lay it out right now. I do have a bit of a personal connection to this horse. Uh, I have interviewed his trainer on a racing run now before, and his trainer's actually an alumni from the high school that I went to. So uh, a little bit of personal connection there, which has probably influenced the reason that he is on this list as high as he is. So uh, I'm going to just put that little shallow disclaimer out there. But after his runs at the lower level tracks, he stepped up to grade one company at Arlington Park. He won there, Arlington, Washington, Futurity. It was a good win. I don't really know who he beat in that race. I have seen a video of the stretch run before, and it was a good win for him. But he had an issue when he was uh, really throughout his entire career of jumping shadows, and that's actually why he lost his next race, the Young America. And then the interesting thing about him is he actually could have been the first Breeders' Cup winner if the configuration of the first Breeders' Cup juvenile was not changed. Originally, it was going to be run as a two-turn mile at Hollywood Park. It was changed to a one-turn mile. And Spendabuck was not a horse who liked going one turn. He always wanted to go two turns. He was one of those. I compared him a lot to, to Nick's Go in that facet because Nick's Go was another horse who needed to go two turns to be successful. But, uh, you know, he also had some physical issues with him. He actually, after the Breeders' Cup, had to have arthroscopic surgery, one of the first horses that underwent that kind of procedure. But uh, after he came back from that, uh, he had one race in the Bayshore, which was okay. Again, needed to go two turns. But when he got two turns, that's when he got brilliant. He won two prep races at Garden State Park going into the Kentucky Derby. One of them was the Cherry Hill Mile, obviously going a mile. He won that race by 10 lengths. And then the other one was the Garden State Stakes, the regional final prep at Garden State Park for the Kentucky Derby. He won that race by eight lengths and was two fifths of a second off of Secretariat's record for a mile and an eighth at that distance. Goes into the Kentucky Derby, puts on an absolute freak show in the Kentucky Derby. He, he must have just been feeling better than all the other horses that day because he went out there. He was never a horse that blew them out of the water. He was a battler, a grinder type horse. And I, I don't mean that in the way that he moved. I mean, mean that in the way that he wasn't ever going to let you buy in the stretch. But uh, on the Kentucky Derby, he certainly helped that Eternal Prince missed the break in that Kentucky Derby and Spendabuck was able to go out on his own. But the margin of victory was so wide and he won so emphatically that it really wouldn't have mattered. I actually talked to Richard McLeory about this this past weekend at the Belmont Stakes, and I asked him specifically what would have happened if Eternal Prince had made the break in the Kentucky Derby, and he said that they had no chance, that Spendabuck would have still won that race by the, as wide a margin as he won by. So an incredible Kentucky Derby performance. It was the third fastest time for the longest time in the history of the Kentucky Derby, and has only since been eclipsed by one other horse that was Monarchos in 2001. He was the original horse to skip the Preakness for something else, so uh, this drama with Rich Strike is not new to horse racing. Spendabuck actually passed up the Preakness to run at the Jersey Derby at Garden State Park. There was a $2.6 million bonus, which would be the biggest purse that any horse had competed for on any one day uh, of racing until 2004, so that puts into perspective the amount of money that these connections were running for. He won the Jersey Derby by a, a short head, but he won that race, and that was the important thing for him. Went to the Haskell next to, in his next start. The circumstances surrounding that defeat were very interesting. The track had been very, very wet the, the day before. There was a hurricane in the New Jersey area. They put dirt into the track to dry it out, and all that did was make the track heavier. Bendebuck, a front-running horse that showed lots of speed all the time, that tired him out. That's why he lost the Haskell. In his final career effort, the Monmouth Handicap, which is now, I believe, the Philip Islin, he won that race over the 1984 Travers winner, Cardenasqua. There is a replay for that race. It is buried out somewhere in a documentary on YouTube, but I have seen that before. And he won it exactly the same way he won the Jersey Derby. Horse came up to him, Cardin Ascra, in the stretch. Spendabuck did not let him by. Unfortunately, he did not run after that. In training up to the Pennsylvania Derby, he suffered a career-ending injury, but he was awarded Horse of the Year and Champion Three-Year-Old in 1985, and rightfully so, given his brilliant victory in the Kentucky Derby and then the accolades that he had following it. And that concludes our talk of Spendabuck. Thank you again to Jack Sargent for guest appearing in today's video. And now, before we get to number one, here are some honorable mentions. Mineshaft, 
Many people remember him as a sire, but not nearly as many people remember him as the 2003 Horse of the Year. And that was mainly because he was injured right before the 2003 Breeders' Cup Classic, which was won that year by Pleasantly Perfect. But before that, Mineshaft won 7 of 9 races, including multiple Grade 1s. Just not the Breeders' Cup, so more people remember him as a stud than as a champion racehorse. But he's still pretty well known regardless, even if there is more to acknowledge about him. So that's why he didn't make the list. Gallant Man while most people remember him for his infamous defeat in the 1957 Kentucky Derby, he still outfinished both Roundtable and Bold Ruler in that very race, both horses considered in the top 20 for greatest horses of the 20th century. In Bold Ruler's case, he raced against him a total of 7 times, defeating him 4 of them, including in the Belmont Stakes just 2 starts after the Derby. And despite beating some of the greatest racehorses of all time, sometimes multiple times, Gallant Man never received any end-of-year awards during his career. And to this very day, he is still mostly just remembered for a race that he lost by no fault of his own. Criminal type. Another overshadowed horse of the year just like Mineshaft, because just like him, he was injured right before the Breeders' Cup Classic, he is to this very day the only horse ever to have beaten both Easy Goer and Sunday Silence, names you've probably heard of before. And in this Met Mile race that you're seeing in front of you, he also defeated Hall of Fame sprinter Housebuster, as well as the aforementioned Easy Goer. All names you probably know a lot more than this champion by D. Wayne Lucas. Tight Spot. This was a horse I didn't even know existed until about a week ago when Jack Sargent brought it up in the development of this video. And while I didn't have any available spots on the list for him, which is ironic considering his name, I think he still deserves some recognition, because during his last 12 career starts, he won 10 of them, including a winning streak that spanned 8 races and 2 grade 1s, including the Arlington Million, which was his biggest career victory. And while his only other grade 1 victory throughout his life was in the Eddie Reed handicap, such consistency over that many races is something that should be recognized and praised. Riva Ridge. This was a horse that for the longest time was going to be on this list, but was eventually pushed out when I decided to include Paradise Creek. While it's a real shame that he was never given any proper screen time in Disney's Secretariat despite them using his story for the movie, during the time he raced and even afterward, he's been pretty well recognized, with a Hall of Fame induction and two Eclipse Awards to his name. Main Sequence. In 2014, there were many inconsistent champions. California Chrome won the Derby in the Preakness, but then had a three-race losing streak afterward. Byron won the Breeders' Cup Classic, but was second to last in the Preakness and dead last in the Traverse Stakes. Meanwhile, Main Sequence ran four times in Grade 1 Company and didn't lose a single time, including in the Breeders' Cup Turf against Arc de Triomphe runner-up Flincher. He was more than just consistent in 2014, he was perfect. And yet, most people just remember the best horses on dirt that year, which is a real shame. Awesome again. Ever since the inception of the Eclipse Awards in 1971, there's never been a greater horse to have never won a single one in his lifetime than Awesome Again. In 1998 specifically, he ran six times and never lost a single one of them. Although yes, only two of those victories were actually in Grade 1 company, when push came to shove, he was the best horse that year winning the greatest running of the Breeders' Cup Classic ever created. He defeated two future Hall of Famers, one of them a Kentucky Derby and Dubai World Cup winner, the other one was that year's Horse of the Year, as well as defeating an international superstar in England, and beating two Belmont Stakes winners and that year's Traverse Stakes winner. You couldn't have asked for a better field, and Awesome Again trounced all of them, and yet has no awards to show for it. And that concludes our honorable mentions. Now it's time for who I think is the most underrated racehorse in history. Prove out. During his career, he wasn't the most consistent horse. He doesn't have any end of year honors to his name. He ran 30 times total in his career and only won three stakes races. And yet, during two months in 1973, Prove out was one of the greatest of all time. Before he ever even won a stakes race, he showed promise, setting two track records at Belmont Park and Allowance Company. The first was at seven furlongs, and in that race, he beat a three-year-old horse named Forgo, who would go on to be one of the greatest older horses of all time. Then he'd set another track record at a mile and a sixteenth. But his time to shine came in the Woodward Stakes that year. In it was a horse named Secretariat, the greatest racehorse of all time. In hindsight, he never should have been in that race. He was meant to be a substitute for Riva Ridge if the race turned up sloppy, and it was only two weeks after Secretariat had set a world record in the Marlboro Cup. He was not at his best. And so, an upset emerged, when Proveout snuck in on the inside rail and defeated Secretariat at a mile and a half at Belmont Park. When Proveout crossed the finish line that day, defeating both Secretariat and another Hall of Famer, Cougar 2, 
He stopped the clock at 2 minutes, 25 and 4 fifth seconds. The second fastest mile and a half ever ran at Belmont Park. The only one faster was Secretariat's 1973 Belmont Stakes victory. It would have taken that to defeat Proveout that day. And to add on to how crazy this was, Proveout was carrying 7 more pounds than Secretariat. He carried more weight than the greatest of all time, and then came closer than any horse before or since to matching his record-setting run in the Belmont. And that wasn't even the end of it. He got his shot to face off against Reva Ridge in the 2 Mile Jockey Club Gold Cup. He won it effortlessly and stopped the clock at 3 minutes 20 seconds flat. The only horse to have ever run 2 miles on the dirt faster was the legendary Kelso. After that, he wasn't the same horse, but during those two months, he beat four different Hall of Famers, set two different track records, and then ran the fastest mile and a half and two miles, only bettered by Secretariat and Kelso. Two of the top five greatest racehorses of all time. He wasn't great all the time, but during those two months, he was one of the greatest. And thus, he is in my opinion, the most underrated racehorse of all time. And that concludes our list. Holy smokes did we have a lot to talk about. I mean, just look at how long this video turned out. 31 minutes. I don't know whether to be proud or horrified, but the video is now done. We've made it to the end of the list. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it. And if you want me to make a part 2 to this, I might. There are certainly enough overlooked racehorses out there to make this an entire series, so a sequel to this isn't out of the question. But that's only if you guys want it. In the meantime, see you guys next time.